Welcome to the Private School Leader Podcast, where private school leaders learn how to thrive and not just survive as they serve and lead their schools. I strongly believe that it is possible to have a long and happy and fulfilling career as a private school leader. And my passion is to help you figure out exactly how to do that right here on the Private School Leader Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Minkus. I'm sure that you have heard the saying, famous last words. And those are the last words that someone says before they die. And I was noticing, I looked up some famous last words and didn't know about any of these, but Elvis Presley, right before he died, said, I hope I haven't bored you. Those were Elvis's last words. Stephen Hawking's last words were, let's make the future a place that we want to visit. And he recorded that, and then it was beamed towards a black hole. Interesting. Nostradamus, he's the world-famous historic predictor of the future. Nostradamus' last words were, tomorrow at sunrise, I shall no longer be here. And he was right. And Bob Marley said, money can't buy life. So we give a lot of attention to famous last words, but sometimes I think we don't give enough attention to famous first words. And if you have children or nieces or nephews, sometimes you're lucky enough to hear baby's first words. And for me, I know I was hoping that it was daddy or mommy. Um, And for one of my daughters, her first word was hi. And for two of my daughters, their first words were no. So um, I don't know if any of you have experienced that, that you're hoping for something and then you get the first words are no. And the other thing I thought of was I thought of Neil Armstrong. And the first words that he said when man stepped onto the moon Very famously, Neil Armstrong said, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. So I want you to think about the power of the first thing that you say. So when you get home from work, let's say that in situation number one, you say, how was your day to your partner or your spouse, your significant other? You get home from work, you say, how was your day? Or... You get home from work and the first thing you say is, what's for dinner? Two different outcomes. Those words are powerful. And then one more just to think about. Let's say you you have a child and they show you the project that they've been working on for a week. And beaming, they show you this poster of the life of Abraham Lincoln. And the first thing that you say is, that's fantastic. You worked so hard. Or the first thing you say is, the photo on the top right is crooked. So the title of today's episode is These Three Little Words Will Change the Way That You Lead. And about a year ago, I started saying these three little words at work, and I started saying them first. And by first, I mean that these three little words were the first thing that I said after someone told me something difficult that had happened to them or when someone tells me that they finished something that they, that I had asked them to do, or when someone most importantly was showing me something that they had finished that I had asked them to do. But most frequently it happens when someone tells me something difficult. And so the first words that I say, these three little words are first of all, three little words are first of all, And on today's episode of the Private School Leader Podcast, we are going to discuss how saying, first of all, can change the way that you lead. But before we jump into today's topic, I want to give you a gift just to say thank you for listening to this podcast. I've created a free guide for you called Five Strategies to Help You Work with Difficult Parents. We all know that working with parents is part of the job, and most of our parents are great, but some of them can be very demanding and emotional and difficult, and this guide will give you the tools you need to build better relationships and have better meetings with the difficult parents at your school. So go to theprivateschoolleader.com parents to grab that guide, 
And again, thank you for listening every week to this podcast. And you can grab five strategies to help you work with difficult parents over at theprivateschoolleader.com slash parents. So let's face it, we are all very, very, very busy at our jobs as private school leaders. We're always on our way somewhere. We're always late for something. We're literally trying to juggle 17 competing priorities at the same time. And what that leads to is us taking shortcuts. Now, some of those shortcuts are okay, and actually most of them are necessary. So I've mentioned before on the podcast that one of the things that I do that's kind of a shortcut is I want to post at least one or two photos to Instagram every day. So when do I do that? I'm so busy. I don't have time to post to Instagram. But every single day, I warm up a Weight Watchers or Lean Cuisine in the microwave. And so while my microwavable frozen lunch is is heating up in the microwave that's when I pull out my phone look at my photo gallery of the past 24 hours and then post one or two photos to Instagram another way that we do a shortcut is a walk and talk on the way to a meeting all different things that we do that are shortcuts and most of them are very important and they're necessary but about a year ago I realized that I was taking a shortcut when it came to people's feelings And that was especially true when someone told me something difficult that had happened to them. Because when good things happen, it's easy. I just say, congratulations, or great job, or good for you. But when they would tell me something difficult, I was realizing that I was taking a shortcut when it came to their emotions. And then, as I mentioned before, the other couple of times that I would notice that I was doing this was when I'd ask someone to do something, and they let me know that it was finished, or especially when someone was showing me something that they had finished that I had asked them to do. Now, those two things, the the doing and the showing, are less frequent than the telling of something that's difficult. We deal with that all the time, problems and people telling us stuff. But I was noticing that I was taking a shortcut with people's feelings. And so when a person is done talking to you, The first thing that we should say is, first of all, well, why? Why should we say, first of all, when someone is done speaking? Well, I want you to use your imagination because I'm going to paint three scenarios. I'm going to present you with three scenarios. And I want you to think of one word as we go through these scenarios, and that word is empathy. And we'll come back to that. But if you're thinking of the word empathy, then hopefully these scenarios will make a little more sense as to how putting those three little words, first of all, at the beginning of the very first thing that you say when the person is done talking, will display empathy. So these three scenarios, scenario number one is a teacher walks into your office with a problem. Scenario number two is that you are having a meeting with an upset parent. And scenario number three is a teacher shows you a presentation that you asked them to create. So here's scenario number one. I just want you to use your imagination and let this sink in and just paint this picture for you. Just imagine this. You just got off the phone with a parent. You have 15 minutes before your next meeting. And you really need to finish an email, and it has to go out today, and you're going to spend the next 10 minutes finishing that email so that you can send it before the meeting. But then there's a knock at your door, and it is one of your teachers, and she asks, do you have a couple minutes to talk? You can tell by the look on her face and her body language that you should say yes, and so you invite her in. So she starts telling you about a very difficult phone call that she just had with a parent a little earlier in the day. And the thing that this teacher is upset about is the parent questioned the teacher's integrity about her grading and was implying that she didn't like her child and that was leading to a lower grade and was just really questioning the teacher's integrity about her grading. You can see the teacher start to get a little emotional about that. And so right away you start thinking about the advice that you should give to this teacher. After all, you want to help. When the teacher is done talking, the first thing you say is, you should. 
And then you tell her what she should do to make things better with the parent. So the teacher stops talking and you say, well, you should dot, dot, dot. And you start giving advice. The teacher listens intently and then nods. And when you're done giving her advice, she says, okay, thank you. And goes back to her classroom. You grab your laptop and your water bottle and you head to your next meeting. So that's scenario number one. Well, how could you have handled this differently? So same scenario, teacher is there. She's telling you about this difficult phone call that she had with the parent. Everything is the same except for what you say first. So she stops talking and you say, first of all, that sounds very upsetting. And I'm sorry that you had to listen to a parent question your integrity about grading. And then you ask, do you want my help with this or do you just want to vent? And she says, I would love some advice. And so you give her the exact same advice that you gave in the first scenario when you said you should. So what's the difference between the first way that you reacted and the second way? Well, a couple of things. First of all, you validated the teacher's feelings. Of course that sucked. She just got off a phone call with a parent and questioned her integrity of her grading. You really listened because listening with the intent to respond is not listening. So while someone's talking to you, and let's face it, we do this all the time. I do this all the time because we are problem solvers. As independent school leaders, we solve problems all day long from the moment we get up till the moment we go to bed. And then as we're falling asleep, we're thinking about how to solve tomorrow's problems. So it's natural for us to have that inclination to start thinking right away when we hear about the problem. Okay. 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 This is how we're going to fix that problem. So the, the tricky part with that is twofold. Number one, if we're listening with the intent to respond because we're listening about how to solve the problem, we're not really listening, okay? And then the second thing is, you're not sure that this person wants you to solve this problem for you. And in the second situation, you asked permission to give advice. You said, do you want help with this or do you just want to vent? And I'll tell you what, I've been married for 31 years, 32 years, and it took me probably nine years to figure out that when my wife came home from work, that most of the time she just wanted me to listen and say, that really stinks. That really sucks. And she didn't want me to solve the problem. And I thought I was being helpful. I wanted to fix the situation. I wanted to give her advice on, well, this is how you should have handled that with this coworker and so on and so forth. So we've all been in that situation where we just wanted to get it out and tell somebody and we didn't want them to give us unsolicited advice or to fix the problem for us. And yet they tried. And so with this teacher in your office, you're asking, well, do you want my help with this or do you just want to talk? Do you just want to vent? So you ask permission. And then finally, on this scenario, you tamed the advice monster. So what is the advice monster? Well, I touched on it a little bit before. It's that thing that lives inside of us that is there because we are usually asked for advice. We're usually tasked with solving the problem. We're usually asked to uh, say, well, here's what I think, or here's how I think we should proceed with this, because that's what we do all day long. But we need to tame the advice monster because sometimes people aren't looking for advice. And even if we just keep the advice monster on a leash and show some empathy at the beginning of the conversation and acknowledge the feelings of that person, then they are going to be much more inclined to listen to the advice. Remember I said that she said, okay, thanks, and just walked out of the room? She probably... Who knows, but uh, my guess is is that she probably felt like, well, I don't know that I was really heard. Um, and just taming the advice monster, keeping it on the leash, being curious a little bit longer before we just come out there uh, with all that advice is something that is um, much needed. And I've tried to do a better job with that um, over the past couple of years. Okay, on to scenario number two. 
Remember, we're talking about three little words that will change the way that you lead, and those three little words are first of all, and those are the first things that you say after you have one of these situations. So scenario number two involves a parent. You are in your office having a meeting with the father of a sixth grade girl named Olivia. Olivia has been a student at your school for about three weeks after the family moved to your town from Phoenix, Arizona. Olivia's father is explaining why he is so upset about the fact that his daughter is being bullied at your school. And you can feel your blood pressure start to rise when he says the word bullied. He explains what this bullying looks like to him. The girls in sixth grade are not including Olivia in their friend groups, especially when it comes to being to doing things outside of school. None of these girls have invited Olivia to do anything outside of school. Olivia is in the sixth grade group text, and it's awkward for her when she hears about some of the girls making plans and then sees photos on Instagram of the fun that they're having. They're not calling her names or being mean to her, but this type of exclusionary behavior is bullying, according to the father. Then Olivia's father says, what are you going to do about this? And you say, I take exception with the word bullying. What you are describing is not bullying. We are not going to force students to hang out with her outside of school. Olivia has only been here three weeks. Just give it some more time. Okay. So how could you have handled this situation differently? What if you had said this instead? So he says exactly the same thing about the bullying and the outside of school stuff and all that. And then you say this. First of all, this sounds really, really hard for Olivia and for you too. I can see why Olivia is feeling left out when she sees her classmates doing things outside of school. And I'm sure that feels really lousy. I'm sure that it has been very difficult for you to watch that also and hard on your whole family to move to a new city partway through a school year. And, well, as you might expect, the friend groups among sixth grade girls are pretty well established. But that said, in my experience, most of these situations work out pretty well. It just takes some time. She has been here three weeks, and Olivia will just keep coming to school and keep being her friendly and wonderful self. And I'm also going to talk to my teachers about being strategic about how they pair Olivia for group work. I know that Olivia is on the basketball team. I'm going to talk to the coach about how they're grouped when they do drills in practice or when they scrimmage. And then I'd like to check in with you in three weeks and just see how it's going. So what's the difference between those two situations? Okay, well, first of all, and I think most importantly, bullying for me is a triggering word. And I immediately... Um, in that first situation, the administrator, the leader addressed that and said that this parent was mislabeling bullying and that this wasn't bullying. All right, well, now the parent is defensive and then you're going to get in a back and forth about whether or not this is bullying and you've completely missed the point of trying to help Olivia. So some of the things that you did by saying, first of all, and the things that you said immediately after. You acknowledge that this is very uncomfortable and very difficult for Olivia. Again, empathy. You acknowledge that it was hard for a parent and a family to watch this and that it was hard for the whole family to move. You're letting them know that this situation needs more time, but still saying that you'll talk to Olivia's teachers and her coach and you'll check in with this dad in three weeks. And you didn't just say, well, give it time and then give him no plan or no hope and then send him off that way. And I want to do a quick sidebar. Over the years, I've had parents come on really strong when it comes to this kind of situation. They're, they've moved to the new city, especially when it comes to they've moved and the kids weren't crazy about the move and it had to do with one of the parents' uh, work situation. And I believe strongly that the reason they come on so strong is because the parents are dealing with guilt over the move and they see that their child's unhappy and awkward and has not yet acclimated to the social situation at the school and they want to accelerate the timeline 
they want us to sprink, sprinkle magic pixie dust on the situation and all of a sudden have them acting like lifelong friends. And we know at our schools that our kids are pretty great. Um, they're pretty inclusive. And that in time, if this child just continues to show up and be friendly and be authentic, that it's probably going to work out just fine. But that sidebar is that parents, I think, are dealing with the additional emotion of guilt over the move and seeing their child unhappy. And that's why they get disproportionately upset about the situation and how, quote unquote, slowly this is happening. So um, I'll get off my sidebar soapbox about that, but I just wanted to share that. The bottom line is, is that you acknowledged that this was difficult for Olivia and for the family and you used empathy and instead of just jumping right in and talking about bullying, and you'll notice that in the second scenario, or the second uh, suggestion that I gave as far as we'll try saying this instead, I never even addressed the word bullying. Didn't address it on purpose um, because that's not a fight I was going to win. And so, um, again, there's some advice in here about how to deal with different situations, but, um, really the key takeaway for you is about the, um, leading with saying, first of all, okay. Scenario number three, you're standing in the hallway during a class change. A teacher walks up to you and says, I just wanted to let you know that the presentation that you asked me to create is done and ready to roll. He opens his laptop to show you and starts clicking through the first several slides. You say, this looks great, but I'm wondering if you can make the font larger so that the slides are easier to read. And he says, sure, no problem. And you say, thanks, and walk off down the hallway headed to your next meeting. All right, how could you have handled this situation differently? What if you had said this instead? So everything's the same, the hallway, the laptop, the slideshow, um, And except for what you say first, that's what's different. So you make eye contact and you say, first of all, I really want to thank you for doing that. I know you worked really hard on that. I can see that. I know it was a big project and I know you're very, very busy. And I just really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, And it looks fantastic. I love the color scheme. Um, Looks great. I just, one thing I was wondering about, do you have time to go in and make the font bigger so that the slides are easier to read. If not, no problem. I, I can do that myself. No problem. Now, regardless of how they respond, you genuinely thank them again for their hard work and you walk down the hall and head to your next meeting. So what's the difference? Well, first of all, just saying thanks quickly and then jumping right in to the um, can you make the font bigger is sort of like at the beginning of the episode when I said your kid comes to you with their poster of Abraham Lincoln and the first thing you say is is that that photo at the top right is crooked so in the second situation the way that you handled it when you started with first of all you displayed genuine gratitude you gave a genuine thank you you acknowledged their hard work you picked out something specific from the slideshow that you liked, you showed empathy for the fact that this teacher has a very busy schedule. And then after you did those three things, you asked politely about the change in font size. And you said, if you have the time. And once again, that's acknowledging how busy they are. And you are actually prepared to change the font size yourself since the teacher did most of the work. It's not going to take you that long if they're just like, well, you know what? I'm really slammed. I can't do that. But most of the time they're going to be like, sure, no problem. So just again, I'm trying to paint these pictures as far as I don't think that the difference between the two really takes that much more time. The amount of time that you're speaking, that words are coming out of your mouth is not that much different in the first place or the second place when you lead with first of all but the outcomes are hugely different and i asked you to think about the word empathy and there's two situ- two situations where i don't lead with empathy empathy and when i don't say first of all and and that's when i'm having a chaotic day and when i'm listening with the intent to respond because i don't like something that i just heard so Again, those were a couple of the things about a year ago that really got me thinking about how I actually needed to respond 
and to come up with something where I was going to check myself and lead with empathy. So the chaotic day and listening with the intent to respond because I heard something I didn't like. So let's just touch on the chaotic day. There's another quote that I've heard, and it says that empathy is the first casualty of a chaotic day. So I want you to think about that. Empathy is the first casualty of a chaotic day. And I can prove it to you. So let's say these two different situations come up. One is 10 a.m. You're feeling productive. Things are pretty calm in the school, surprisingly. A teacher wants to talk to you about his mother's upcoming surgery. And so you're going to listen. You're going to show empathy. You're going to try to help. Now, here's the different situation. It's 2 p.m. You're having a chaotic day. Nothing is going right. Three discipline situations you've already dealt with. Two parent phone calls. You've already shown up late for two meetings. You've had to cancel a teacher observation. You had to cancel your lunch with the fifth graders. The health inspector showed up at lunchtime, and that's why you canceled the lunch with fifth grade. Your board president left a message at 9 a.m. saying she needs to talk, and it's now 2 p.m., and you have not yet called her back, and your stomach is growling because you're hungry because you missed lunch. It's 2 p.m. You've only been in your office for five minutes all day. That same teacher shows up at your door and wants to talk to you about his mother's upcoming surgery. Now, you deserve an Academy Award if you can show the same amount of empathy in both situations, same amount of patience and active listening at 2 p.m. on the chaotic day versus 10 a.m. on the calm day. Empathy is the first casualty of a chaotic day, which is why we need something that will check ourselves so that we lead with empathy. And then the second thing I mentioned was listening with the intent to respond because I didn't like something that I heard. So this happens most often for me with parents, and they'll say a triggering word like bullying, or they'll say that teacher doesn't care, or they'll say always or never. And when they say something that I know isn't true, that's also when I start listening with the intent to respond. And I want the first thing that I say is to correct the thing that they said that wasn't true. I want to get defensive about the triggering word and say, well, that's not bullying or our teachers do care. So just stop and think about how well that is going to go. I gave you three scenarios where it didn't go well in the first one and it probably would go better in the second one. So if the first thing I say is telling them that they're wrong and calling them a liar, this parent meeting is not going to end well. And I just, you know, those things, I'll get to them later in the conversation, the bullying part or that the teacher doesn't care or the thing that they said that wasn't true. I'll get to that later. I'll get to how they're mischaracterizing the word bullying. Um, I'll address those things. I'll make sure I do, but I'll do it later in the conversation. But I'll start off with, first of all, and I'll lead with empathy. And so, like I said, this was happening to me. And about a year ago, I just decided I need something where I can catch myself. And so I just started using, first of all, at the beginning of the sentence. And that was a thing that kind of forced me into stopping, thinking, looking at it from their point of view, speaking empathically. And then for a long time, I actually said, first of all, out loud. And now I just say it in my head. And then I just go into that sounds like that is a really frustrating situation. And we hear a lot as leaders lead with empathy, lead with empathy. Okay, well, there are a lot of ways to do this. But one way to do it, one small way to try to make a little dent in this is to say, first of all, and these three little words have been a game changer for me. And I think that they can also be a game changer and make a big difference for you as well. So what are our big takeaways from today's episode? Well, lots of people say we should lead with empathy, but how do we do that? One small way is to say, first of all, after someone shares a hard situation or someone is showing you or telling you about something that they did for you. Two situations when I don't lead with empathy and when I don't say first of all are when I'm having a chaotic day because empathy is the first casualty of a chaotic day and also when I am listening with the intent to respond. 
and I am especially that's especially true when there's a triggering word or I heard something them say something that I feel like I need to correct or I need to defend. Listening with the intent to respond is not listening. So your call to action is to start saying, first of all, when someone tells you something difficult or someone does something for you. All right, so let's wrap it up. I want to remind I want to remind you about a ton of free resources that are available to you over at the privateschoolleader.com slash resources. We have plug and play PDs that you can use with your staff, top 10 lists of leadership books, guides for how to protect your school from a lawsuit and how to be a better leader. And you can get those over at the privateschoolleader.com slash resources. And speaking of those free resources, just a quick reminder that I've created a free guide for you called five strategies to help you work with difficult parents. And you can get that at the privateschoolleader.com slash parents. And I strongly believe that it is possible to have a long and happy and fulfilling career as a private school leader. And it's my passion to help you figure out how to do that. So please be sure to subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss an episode. Today's show notes can be found at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode 29. A new episode of this podcast comes out every week on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. You can connect with me on Instagram at the private school leader or on Twitter at the PS leader. And if you got value from this episode, please subscribe to the podcast. I'd also love to hear from you. If you're getting value from this episode, my email address is mark.o.minkus at gmail.com, M-A-R-K dot O dot M-I-N-K-U-S at gmail.com. Just drop me a line and let me know uh, what your uh, pain points are or what you um, have used um, a strategy that you heard on this podcast. And I've been your host, Mark Minkus. I just want to say that I appreciate you and the amazing work that you're doing at your school as you are making a difference. Thank you so much for taking some of your precious time to join me here today. And I will see you next time on the Private School Leader Podcast. And until then, always remember to serve first, lead second, and make a difference.